In the last video of the standard model series, we finished up discussing all of the interactions of the standard model by unifying the electromagnetic and weak interactions into one combined electroweak interaction. This, along with the strong interaction of quantum chromodynamics, makes up the backbone of the standard model and describes all of the interactions that we know of aside from gravity. However, while these are incredibly vital to our understanding of the universe, there is more to the standard model than just its interactions. In particular, we haven't given too much love to the fermions of the theory, and it turns out that this sector has a lot of interesting physics as well as history. So in this final video of the standard model series, we will introduce the rest of the fermions as well as give some insight into how they were theorized and discovered. Now, on the surface, these additional fermions seem kind of boring. They essentially are just heavier copies of the particles we've already seen. However, it turns out that introducing these particles really adds some complexity, as well as some very non-trivial effects. Because physicists have apparently run out of names for things, the different types of fermions are typically known as flavors. So, for example, we would say that the electron and muon are two flavors of charged leptons. On the topic of charged leptons, we will start our discussion of additional flavors here. Now, after the discovery of the muon, a lot of research went into trying to figure out what differentiated the electron and muon from each other. Of course, it was known that the muon is quite a bit heavier than the electron, but the interactions involving electrons and those involving muons seem to always be pretty much exactly the same within the standard model. So, if a difference in the interactions was discovered, then this would be a key indication that there are interactions beyond those of the standard model, which talk to the charged leptons. This idea is known as lepton flavor universality violation, and is still an interesting research area today. After a lot of study, no such differences were found. So the question became, if there can be two charged leptons whose only difference is their mass, why can't there be others? Now, if these leptons were treated the same way as the electron and muon according to the standard model interactions, then they could be produced the same way that we can produce, for example, muons. Just like muons, it would be expected that such new leptons would be unstable and would decay via weak interactions through charged current interactions with the W boson. Since the electron and muon are treated pretty much equally in weak interactions, aside from mass effects, it would be expected that this new lepton could decay either into electrons or muons, along with their associated neutrinos. So, the experiment proposed by Martin Pearl in the mid-70s was to try to pair produce these new leptons and look for final states with only a single electron and a single muon. This is important. It should be both an electron and a muon, not two electrons or two muons, since these can be easily produced through interactions that don't involve a new lepton. Additionally, seeing only one muon and one electron is extremely important, since we know the charged leptons only participate in charged current weak interactions with neutrinos, which won't be seen in the detector. Other particles, like pions and photons, can arise from intermediate hadronic states, so this wouldn't be a clean signal for a new charged lepton. This exact decay into a single electron and a single muon was observed at the Stanford Linear Accelerator, aka SLAC, using high-energy electron-positron annihilations, thus leading to a new charged lepton known as the tau to be added to the standard model. Of course, when unifying electromagnetism and weak interactions, we always need to pair charged leptons with the corresponding neutrino, so we know we also need to add the so-called tau neutrino to the standard model. The introduction of the tau and tau neutrino completes the discussion of the lepton sector, so now it's time to move on to the quarks, which turn out to be incredibly fascinating, albeit a bit complicated. In order to talk about this, we have to go back to the idea of isospin, which I talked about a bit in my original video on quarks. To quickly recap, 
Isospin is a quantum number which can be assigned to mesons in order to group them together into families, where all of the particles in the families have roughly the same mass. Once the quark model was introduced, it was found that the fundamental units of isospin could be simply explained by the up and down quarks, the up carrying isospin plus one half, and the down quark with isospin minus one half. Here's where things get even more interesting. Most of these hadrons are unstable, and many can decay through either the strong or the weak interaction. However, the strong interactions conserve isospin, while weak interactions can violate it. The consequence of this is that since, as the name suggests, the strong interaction is significantly stronger than the weak interaction, massive hadrons will tend to undergo strong decays until they reach the lightest possible hadrons. For just up and down quarks, these are the pions and the nucleons, from which these lightest states can decay weakly until they are stable. So, for example, the isospin 3 halves delta plus plus baryon will decay strongly into a proton with isospin plus 1 half and a pion with isospin plus 1 with a lifetime of about 10 to the minus 24 seconds. While the proton is stable and the pi decays into an anti-muon and a muon neutrino with a lifetime of about 10 to the minus 8 seconds. Notice how vastly different the lifetimes of the strongly versus weakly decaying particles are. This gives a key indicator that a particle is the lightest possible state of a given isospin if it has a very long lifetime, and therefore decays weakly, relative to its strongly decaying cousins. Now, in the late 1940s, a very interesting particle was discovered in cosmic rays, known as the kaon. Arguably, these kaons are the most important particles in the history of particle physics, since they led to the discovery of four elementary particles, nearly a quarter of the entire standard model. As it turns out, kaons are spin-zero particles, like the pions, but with nearly four times the mass. It was also found that kaons could be produced very rapidly by colliding pions and protons, for example in cosmic ray showers, showing that they did participate in strong interactions. With this, one might naively expect kaons to strongly decay into pions with a very short lifetime. However, this did not seem to be the case. While it is possible for kaons to decay into pions, this reaction is very slow, again with a lifetime of about 10 to the minus 8 seconds, and in fact, the slightly more preferred decay mode is a charged kaon decaying into a muon and muon neutrino, just like the pion. This observation was quite puzzling to physicists at first, but turned out to have an elegant solution. Consider that there is an extra quantum number, which, like isospin, is conserved by the strong interaction, yet violated by the weak interaction, that kaons possess, but pions don't. This would forbid strong kaon decays into pions, but still allow such decays via the weak interaction, thus explaining the rapid production, the kaons can be produced in pairs through strong interactions, but slow decays. Since this behavior was for some time seen as very bizarre, this new quantum number got the name of strangeness and allowed for a sort of upgraded classification of the hadrons from just isospin classification, known as Gell-Mann's Eightfold Way. After the quark picture had been established, this quantum number also received an upgrade into a fundamental particle, known as the strange quark, which has the same electric charge as the down quark, but with a mass about 20 times as large, depending on the renormalization scheme you use to calculate such quantities. Now, with the strange quark introduced, before we move forward I want to give a fair bit of warning. From this point on, the story gets a bit more complicated, and I wouldn't be doing it the justice it deserves without going into a bit of the math. If you don't fully follow, don't worry, I'll summarize it at the end, and keep in mind that it took physicists about two decades to complete this picture I am about to present. After the discovery of the kaon, as well as a better understanding of the weak interaction, it was found that kaons are made up of a strange or anti-strange quark, and either an up or a down quark or anti-quark, depending on the kaon charge. 
Now, for these particles to decay into pion final states, the strange quark in the kaon must be turned into an up quark through weak decays, exactly analogous to how the down quark in a free neutron is turned into an up quark. One interesting result from studying such decays is that it seems like the weak interactions couple down and up quarks differently than it does strange and up quarks. Keep this in mind since it will become important in a minute or two. Once particle detectors began to become more sophisticated, it became possible to study rarer decays that one wouldn't expect to see pretty much ever in cosmic ray showers. One such decay is a kaon decaying into a pion of the same electric charge and a charged lepton-antilepton pair. Since both the strange quark and the down quark can interact with the up quark, a decay like this one proceeds at leading order in perturbation theory through so-called penguin diagrams like this. These are also typically called flavor-changing neutral currents, or FCNC processes, since the electric charge of the quark line doesn't change between the initial and final states, but the flavor does. Now, note that one would expect this process to be extremely suppressed as compared to the more standard charged current weak decays. Not only does it come with four factors of electroweak coupling constants, whereas the leading decays only come with two factors, but it's also a decay into three particles instead of two, which gives an additional suppression from kinematics. In essence, it's just easier to decay into two particles than into three. Even more so, the leading order process in perturbation theory features a closed loop, which includes an additional suppression. Based on all of this, one can calculate an expected decay rate. However, even with all of these suppressions, experiments seem to suggest that the decay rate of this process was much smaller than predicted. In fact, it just wasn't being seen at all. So how was this reconciled? Well, let's first return to the fact that the weak interactions seem to treat strange and down quarks differently in their couplings to up quarks. In fact, the strength of interaction between the down and up is almost five times as strong as that between the strange and up quarks. This is a bit peculiar, especially when compared to the leptons, who seem to all be treated completely equally by the weak interaction. So here's what we'll do. For the time being, we will ignore the interaction between the strange and up quarks, since it's noticeably weaker than the down-up interaction. And instead, we will suppose that there is an interaction between the strange quark and some new quark that's exactly the same as the up quark in the eyes of the interactions of the standard model, meaning it has the same electric charge and color charge, but it could in principle have a different mass. Now, motivated by the universality of the weak interactions with the leptons, we will insist that this new interaction is exactly the same as the interaction between the down and up quarks. This may seem a bit odd to impose, but here's where the interesting part of the story comes in. Since this is a quantum theory, we know that states can, in general, exist in superpositions, as long as they have the same quantum numbers. These quantum numbers involve things like spin and charge under electromagnetism and QCD. This means that we can form new states in our theory by mixing together the down and strange quarks, as well as the up and this new quark. These mixtures are formed by so-called unitary transformations, which just tells us that the transformations between states have to satisfy certain properties in order to obey the rules of quantum mechanics. Most notably, if we multiply one of these transformations with its conjugate, the resulting combined transformation doesn't change our states at all. This serves to limit the forms that the transformations themselves can take. Now, suppose we start with our states where the down only interacts with the up and the strange only interacts with the new quark, typically given the name of weak eigenstates. We can, of course, mix the down and strange quarks and up and new quark using these unitary transformations. The result of such general mixing is that the new states we get by transforming all interact with each other with different coupling strengths. However, why would we want to work with anything aside from the weak eigenstates? The answer comes from a fact that we have been neglecting to discuss. 
The quarks are allowed to have masses, and in particular, they can have different masses. The issue with working with the mixed up states is that we also mix together the masses. And since the energy of a state depends on its mass and special relativity, these mixed up states won't have a well-defined energy. Physical particles that we observe, however, should have a definite energy. So we should choose our states so that the masses are well-defined. These are the so-called mass eigenstates. This picks out a specific linear combination of weak eigenstates to work in, and we will, in general, get every weak interaction possible between all up-like and all down-like particles. Unfortunately, the literature can be a bit confusing since the quarks are given the same names between weak and mass eigenstates, but from here on, we'll always assume we're talking about the physical mass eigenstates unless otherwise stated. As a side note, the interactions of QED and QCD aren't affected like the weak interactions, because QED and QCD always pair particles with their conjugates. So when we perform a unitary transformation, the transformation will always hit its conjugate, and so the interactions will look the same no matter what linear combination we choose. Now, one interesting property of unitary matrices is that a combination of two such matrices is itself unitary, meaning if we multiply by its conjugate, we always get the identity matrix, a matrix with ones on the diagonal and zero everywhere else. This means that when we change our quark states, the resulting couplings to the weak interactions will always be elements of some new unitary matrix, and this two-dimensional version is known as the Kabibo matrix, named after Nicola Kabibo, who proposed this mechanism for misaligning the quarks. If we return to the flavor-changing neutral current, K on decays, this whole story has a remarkable effect. We now get two diagrams contributing to this process at leading order, one with an internal up quark, and one with an internal new quark, which we will denote with AC. We know that we have to add these two diagrams together to get a final result, and the only thing differentiating them is the couplings. So, following the couplings along the diagrams and adding them together, we get something like this. Now this is quite amazing, because by the properties of unitary matrices, the sum is exactly zero, thus explaining the extreme smallness of the decays. Of course, here we neglected the fact that these internal quarks can have different masses, so one wouldn't expect the result to be exactly zero, but instead just quite small, as long as the mass differences aren't on the order of the W boson mass. This mechanism to suppress FCNCs in the standard model was originally proposed by Glashow, Iliopoulos, and Mayani, and as such is known as the Jim mechanism. This solution to the puzzle of suppressed kaon decays led physicists to search for a new uptype quark, and such a particle was discovered as a constituent of the awkwardly named J psi meson in 1974 at the Stanford Linear Accelerator. This new quark was given the name of the charm due to the elegant solution it posed to the problem of kaon decays. The charm quark turned out to also be quite a bit heavier than the other quarks, a bit more than 10 times as massive as the strange quark. Now, we still aren't quite done. The natural question to ask at this point is, what happens if there are more quarks? In the early 70s, Makoto Kobayashi and Toshihida Maskawa asked a similar question and made a very interesting discovery. Just by the nature of the quark field definitions in quantum field theory, it turns out that the two-dimensional Kabibo matrix could not feature any physical complex elements, and therefore a four-quark model would have no complex couplings. They discovered, however, that a three-dimensional generalization of such a matrix, resulting from adding another down-type and up-type quark, named the Kabibo kobayashi maskawa matrix, or CKM matrix, could feature such complex couplings. Now, complex couplings are very important due to the fact that they allow for CP violation, or an imbalance between matter and antimatter. This can be seen in a simple way. 
we can take a process and replace all particles with their antiparticles by performing a CP transformation. One part of this transformation is complex conjugation. So if any couplings are complex, they will be different in the CP transformed process, meaning that the result can, in general, be different from its unconjugated counterpart. There are some other caveats for CP violation to exist in nature, but the important observation is that it absolutely cannot exist without complex physical parameters in the theory. Said another way, if CP violation were observed in hadronic systems, it would immediately be very strong evidence that there are more than just four quarks. But how to look for CP violation in such systems? One interesting answer comes in the form of the neutral kaon and its antiparticle. This is a very intriguing system due to the fact that both particles carry no electric charge and have the same spin and mass. This means that they have all the same quantum numbers which are preserved by the standard model, differing only in their strangeness and isospin. While these quantities are preserved in strong interactions, they are violated by the weak interaction meaning that the neutral kaon and its antiparticle can mix via weak interactions. This can be seen from a quark-level perturbative picture by introducing two flavor-changing neutral currents, transforming an initial state kaon into a final state antikaon through two W boson exchanges. The result is that, like the quarks themselves, the interaction eigenstates of the neutral kaon system are misaligned with their mass eigenstates, meaning that the physical states seen in experiments are in general linear combinations of the k and the k bar. The fact that neutral kaons and antikaons can mix is crucial for the study of CP violation. If CP is a good symmetry, then we would expect the physical states, known as the k long and the k short, to be made up of evenly weighted mixtures of the K and K bar interaction eigenstates, due to the fact that CP is the transformation which exchanges particles and antiparticles. Such admixtures would mean that replacing the K with a K bar and vice versa would leave the states unchanged, aside from a total sign. In fact, the k long would get an overall minus sign under CP, while the k short would be unchanged. In other words, we would say that the k long would be odd under CP, while the k short would be even. This is very important. If CP is a good symmetry of nature, then the k long could only ever decay into another CP odd state, such as a state with three pions, while the k short, on the other hand, could only ever decay to another CP even state, like a 2 pion final state. Alternatively, this means that if, say, a K long is seen decaying to a CP even state, then CP must be violated. In fact, it means that CP must be violated in weak interactions, since this is the only interaction that can mix the K and K bar particles in the standard model. Luckily, we know exactly how CP violation could enter weak interactions, through complex phases in the CKM matrix in a model with at least six quarks. The first experiment to look for CP violating kaon decays was conducted in the mid-1960s by James Cronin and Val Fitch, and anecdotally, they expected to see nothing. However, to their surprise, their experiment observed the k-long decaying into just two pions, thus violating CP and giving the first evidence to a third generation of quarks. It wasn't until more than a decade later that the first of these two new quarks was discovered at Fermilab, a down-like quark originally called the beauty quark due to its aesthetically pleasing solution to the CP violation problem in neutral kaons, but later renamed to the bottom. The uptype quark in the new pair, called the top, was not discovered until 1995, again at Fermilab. These remaining quark masses are a bit odd. The bottom has a mass similar to the charm, a little less than four times as large while the top has a whopping mass about 40 times as large. In fact, the top quark is the heaviest particle currently known, 
even more massive than the Higgs boson. This mass discrepancy is a very curious property of the quarks, and begs the question of whether or not there is a deeper, still unknown explanation. But that's a topic for another video. Okay, I know that was a lot to take in, so let's recap how all this worked out in the quark sector. After discovering kaons and observing their pattern of rapid production, but slow decays, an analogous quantum number to isospin, known as strangeness, was introduced to explain the phenomenon. Once the isospin picture was upgraded to the quark model, strangeness was as well, leading to the introduction of the strange quark. After this discovery, kaons were studied more deeply, and it was found that flavor-changing neutral currents seemed far more suppressed in nature than the three-quark model predicted. It was discovered that introducing a fourth quark, the charm, led to destructive interference in such processes, thus explaining the heavy suppression of FCNC processes via the gym mechanism. Finally, it was noticed that models with at least six quarks allow for CP-violating couplings in weak interactions. CP violation in neutral kaons was soon observed, which was well explained by such complex weak couplings, giving strong evidence for the bottom and top quarks, which were themselves directly discovered some time later. While on the surface, all of these new fermions simply appear to be copies of the old ones with different masses, we've seen that their interplay with each other creates a rich variety of physics that wouldn't exist otherwise. In fact, it is so interesting that there is an entire field of research known as flavor physics, which studies such interplay and its effects on nature. And with that, the standard model is complete. Built on a backbone of gauge interactions, some of which are spontaneously broken, with an abundant playing field of matter composed of three generations of both quarks and leptons, this makes up all of the physics we know, aside from gravity. And what an incredible feat of theoretical and experimental physics it is, with a story spanning nearly a century, several generations of physicists, and multiple worldwide collaborations. However, although the standard model has proven itself to be incredibly predictive for the universe we live in, we know that it can't be complete. Observations such as neutrino masses and dark matter seem to indicate that the standard model must be extended in some yet unknown manner. However, with that said, I hope that this series has given insight into not only the structure of the standard model, but the motivations behind the different components as well as the beauty of the model as a whole.